Judge Leslie Alden had just sentenced me to one year in jail for contempt of court as part of my divorce. I knew the instant that I saw Judge Alden's haircut that I was finito, gonzo, he's de wa. Here's what happened. I had allowed my ex-wife to take 97% of the marital assets, which totaled $1.7 million for her. I left myself with $72,000, which was quickly consumed by lawyers. Inexplicably, I had also agreed to give my ex-wife an additional $100,000 in cash above and beyond the marital assets that we had. So my ex-wife was supposed to get $1.8 million, but I was only able to come up with $1.7 million. I was $100,000 short. The reason I was $100,000 short was my ex had destroyed my business by issuing subpoenas and deposition requests to my clients. She thought there was more hidden money and more hidden income out there for her to find. Now my clients did not want to be part of a nasty divorce litigation, so they ran for the tall grass and ghosted me. My clients were gone and my income was gone. So then my ex and her legal team filed what's called a show cause petition with the court, asking for the court to put me in jail for contempt of court for failing to come up with the final $100,000 due. Also, my lawyers quit the case the day before the hearing because I owed them a lot of money. So I went into Judge Alden's courtroom without a lawyer. The next thing you know, I'm buck naked and getting a full body cavity search by police officers in the basement of the Fairfax County, Virginia jail before getting into my prison jumpsuit and chained to 11 other inmates. Okay, let's go back to the beginning and find out how I got into this situation. And I touched on this story in a previous video, but people in the comments of that video are asking for a lot more detail. So here goes. And get ready for a really insane story. Actually, beyond insane. Okay, a lot of you in the comments to my recent videos are asking me questions along these lines. How can you keep such a positive disposition in the face of so much anger, hatred, and poison from your ex-wife to the point that she destroyed your business? had you put in jail with help from an insane feminist judge named Leslie Alden, also poisoned your daughters against you and continues to try to destroy your livelihood even today, 19 years after your divorce. And even though your ex got remarried in 2012, what might her current husband think of all this? Might this behavior by my ex-wife, his current wife, cause a bit of nervousness on his part. He seems like a very good guy. My advice to him, keep your head on a swivel. And I've linked to these previous videos below. My ex-wife Betsy even wrote two books trashing me and presenting herself as a picture of virtue. The title of one of her books is It Takes a Parent to Raise a Child, which is a play off Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. In Betsy's book, it takes a parent to raise a child. She presents herself as this heroic single mother who raised four children by herself after the husband, me, supposedly abandoned the family. And the title of this book literally makes no sense. Her second book is a collection of newspaper columns she wrote, largely repeating the same theme. She was also all over TV repeating this theme when she was promoting her books. Betsy Hart didn't exactly write the book on love, but she does write a nationally syndicated column about it. Betsy went through a divorce and suddenly became a single mother of four. She speaks from experience. Her practical and humorous insights on family issues are often featured on shows like Fox and Friends and other media outlets. Betsy's new book, From the Heart, is a collection of some of her most popular columns. But guess what? So many women in particular, and certainly children, get really um, short-shifted in the process. Boy, they really, really do. You went through a divorce in 2004. I what did. was that like for you? Well, I was devastated. I very much did not want it. It was not my choice. But suddenly there I was with four very young children, just Yikes. 10 down to three. And I was sort of thinking, oh my goodness, what, what do I do now? Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a 
wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God. And then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. And over those eight years, learned and grew a lot and learned mm -hmm. through adversity and to let my children see me in adversity and not have yeah. to pretend, oh, this is all great when it's not. And to let it's them so see that hard, pain. It's isn't it? You know, when you're in the yeah. midst of such deep pain yourself and then you feel so... Um, like you have to fill the bill for all of your children at a time where this is very devastating for, right. you, for them too. How did you juggle and all I, of that? I think it's okay to let our children see us when we're broken because so often God works through the brokenness. Mm -hmm. When we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway, that can almost be more powerful, I think, than look at me, I have it all together. Because yeah. one is about God and the other is about me and I want it to be about God. And then so many of those columns made it into my book from the heart yeah. and with a lot of more back story and sort of putting the whole story together um, about making wise choices in relationships about asking for what we as women really want I'm newly engaged and um, we'll be married this fall that's very and exciting and after eight years as a single mom I'm yeah. very grateful so that's all in from the heart until now I've been silent through all this until my 25 year old social media influencer daughter posted a series of viral videos trashing me repeating the same lies she had been told by my ex-wife since our separation and divorce in 2004 and 2005. My dad abandoned my family when I was five years old. That is um, a wife and four kids. He abandoned us and then pursued amateur breakdancing. To see, take a look at this 60 year old break dancer. Yes, 60 years old. This guy wouldn't pay my medical bills. That is not true. This video got 8 million views just on TikTok and tens of millions of views across all social media platforms. Then Maddie went up with an even more negative second video. I know my dad posted like a 10 minute video or whatever being like, you know, my daughter's lying. We have a great relationship. I have a great relationship with all my kids. That's just objectively not true. Like guys, we're all freaking out about this in my family group chat right now. We're being like, he's so unhinged and delusional. We don't know if he actually believes his own narrative or if he's lying on purpose, but he's just like a weird guy. Yeah, he said he lived down the street from us. That's not true. Or like if he did, it was only for a few months maybe, but I don't want to get into this. Like again, like my video was basically like sanitizing the situation and like poking fun at the lightest parts of that childhood trauma. But obviously, in real life it was a lot more like complicated and traumatic and it was really hard he left us immediately married another woman we didn't hear from him for years and then he would visit every few months and we'd go out to dinner but like he truly had no hand in raising us at all some money growing up i like i honestly don't know the nitty-gritty of the financial situation I, I really really don't bottom line is this guy was a completely absent father completely absent father I and this story blew up all over the internet in the media her dad apparently became like a D-list celebrity, became the oldest actively competing breakdancer in the world, went on Good Morning America, went super viral, etc, etc. But she added that he wouldn't pay her medical bills. Then comes Ben, stage name Benny Hanna, with a 10 minute reaction video and some pretty good natured corrections. He claimed he lived close by after the divorce, did pay medical bills, child support, put money into a college fund to the tune of around $5 million all in all to cover the cost of the kids, and said he saw his kids often when they were growing up. But he did admit that from his daughter's perspective as a five-year-old it might seem like abandonment but that in his opinion it was not a totally accurate account whilst we watch this father-daughter union play out in real time obviously elon musk weighs in to tell ben you're awesome i didn't even know but this has got me thinking ben is getting absolutely dragged online with people calling him a deadbeat dad and like loads of other grim stuff are these internet call outs fair like should we be airing our dirty laundry on tiktok because i've seen these happen time and time again and it always turns out that there's another side to the story now i don't really blame maddie for any of this though she is 25 years old and should know better. And she's just repeating the lies she's been told by her mom for 19 years. Now remember the theme of Betsy's books, newspaper columns, and TV appearances. She presents herself as a single mom who raised four kids by herself with no help from the dad who abandoned the family. No help from dad whatsoever, right? What Betsy always fails to mention is I paid her about $4 million over the years in alimony, child support, health insurance, life insurance, contributed more than $600,000 to the kids' college fund. She also fails to mention that I lived a bit more than a mile down the street from the kids in LaGrange, Illinois. Easy walking distance, sidewalks all the way. I saw the kids all the time. So no, I did not abandon the kids at all. Betsy and I got a divorce. 
About half of marriages in America end in divorce. It's common. And no, Betsy did not raise the kids with no help from the dad, as she's been claiming in her books, TV appearances, and newspaper columns. She also took every legal action possible to prevent me from seeing my kids, including filing a motion to prevent visitation. During our divorce proceedings, Betsy destroyed my business with her subpoenas and deposition requests to my clients. So my clients ran for the tall grass. I then fell short on payments. Betsy and her lawyers then filed a show cause petition with the court, asking that I be put in jail for contempt of court. So that's what happened when I had the misfortune of entering the courtroom of this feminist judge, a woman by the name of Judge Leslie Alden. I knew the instant I saw Judge Leslie Alden's haircut that I was in big trouble. And then when I saw how she looked at me, and by the tone of her questions, I knew I was dead in the water. Finito. Gonzo. He's the wah. Another theme of the comments in my previous videos is people want to know more about my second wife, Wanda. Wanda and I have been happily married now for 18 years, since December 6th of 2006. No issues whatsoever. We have a fantastic marriage. So a big part of this video will be contrasting my two wives, my ex-wife, Betsy, with my current wife, Wanda. I'll also be talking about how the family law legal system is totally rigged and stacked against dads to the point of absurdity, to the point that it's pretty much financial suicide for males to get married today. My hope with this video and my other videos is to help dads out there who are divorced or who are getting divorced to avoid the many mistakes that I made in my divorce, because I made every possible mistake in my divorce that it's possible to make. The good news is my son appears to be unaffected by all this drama. Our relationship appears to be fine. I see my son Peter all the time. I met Wanda at a karaoke bar, and what attracted me most to Wanda is her incredible story, far worse than I went through in Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom and eight nights in the Fairfax County Jail. Wanda's background is a story of true grit. Wanda is the opposite of privileged. Now I wish Wanda could sit here next to me while I tell you her background, but she doesn't like to go on camera, much less speak publicly on the internet to people she doesn't know. She's sitting in the other room right now watching TV. Maybe I can get her to pop in here later. And it's taken me many years to pull this story out of Wanda. She doesn't like to talk about it because she says many people went through what she did in Laos. She doesn't see her story as anything special. Wanda grew up in Laos, which is right next to Vietnam, across the Mekong River from Thailand. Her Laotian name is Vondalone. Wanda is an Americanized version of her Laotian name. After the communists conquered Laos in 1975, Wanda's mom and oldest sister, Kamsi, put together a plan for the family to escape to Thailand when Wanda was 13 years old. Wanda's story in Escape from the Communists is similar to movies like The Killing Fields and First They Killed My Father. Wanda's deceased mom, Champa, was born in China. When Japan conquered China and was committing genocide, basically killing everyone, the parents of Wanda's future mom put her on a boat when she was about 15 years old with a suitcase full of cash, gold, and other valuables. This was probably in 1943. Wanda's future mom, Champa, ended up in Laos. She never saw her parents again. Wanda's future mom arrived in Laos as a 15-year-old girl not knowing any Laotian. But she built a life there. She met a guy named An, Wanda's future dad, who is very good looking, by the way. Wanda has two younger brothers, two older brothers, and four older sisters. Mom was very industrious. She knew the value of gold. So she started a cash for gold business. Mom also made food products, mostly baked goods, and sold them at the local market. She put the kids to work in this business, including Wanda. Mom also bought a bus and started a bus service. Wanda's father and Wanda's oldest brother, Sakta, would drive the bus. And the bus had a route. People would get on the bus at various stops and go to the market in Pakse. So this was a third profitable business for the family. Wanda's father also worked as a delivery truck driver for the government when the French were running Laos before the communists took over. The driving entrepreneurial force in the family was Wanda's mom. She made enough money with her baked goods, cash for gold business, and shuttle bus business that Wanda's family was able to buy two houses, paid for the houses with cash. There was no such thing as a mortgage in Laos, at least not that they knew about. 
The house they lived in overlooked the great Mekong River. The other house was for their extended family. So they got to be very well off financially by Laotian standards of that day. Then the communists conquered Laos in 1975. Wanda says we could hear the bombs and gunfire all day and all night. And I, as a teenager, remember following the news about the expansion of the Vietnam War into Laos. My dad had been a speechwriter for Richard Nixon, so this was a story we followed very closely. As a result of U.S. bombing of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Vietnam, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was rerouted through Laos. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was the route through the jungle that the North Vietnamese communists were taking to attack South Vietnam. So now the Vietnam War was coming through where Wanda and her family were living. Wanda says that one day life was great, and then suddenly the war was in her backyard. There was carpet bombing from U.S. bombers, and the communists were coming in. Wanda says her family dug underground shelters for when the bombs started dropping. Then they would come out when the bombs stopped. Wanda and her family did not even really understand what was happening or why these bombs were falling. Wanda's family were just rural people. This just became normal life for us, Wanda says. The bombs would start falling, we would go underground, then we would come out when the bombs stopped to resume life as usual. But when the communists conquered her country, they rounded up many people and put them into labor camps, including Wanda's brother-in-law, Kikio. He was married to Wanda's older sister. Life expectancy in a Laotian communist labor camp was less than two years. When the communists came in, they imposed martial law. Everyone had to be off the streets at night and in their homes. Lights had to be off by 11 p.m. Propaganda would blare all day and evening from the loudspeakers that the communists had set up on the streets. The communists rounded up anyone who'd served in the military under French rule, or who was thought to be an agent of France, the United States, or who was thought to have been infected with Western ideas. This included teachers. It also included Wanda's brother-in-law, Kikio, who had served as an officer in the pre-communist Laotian army. One night, the communist military police knocked on the door of their home. They said Kikio had to come with them to a meeting. When the communist military arrive at your home late at night to tell you you have to come to a meeting, you know it's probably over for you. The best thing that might happen is you would end up in a labor camp. But it's just as likely that they would shoot you and dump your body in a mass grave. Wanda says that if you want to know what it was like, just watch the movie The Killing Fields or the movie First They Killed My Father about the Khmer Rouge takeover of Cambodia. That was us except in Laos, says Wanda. That's what I saw. Wanda's oldest sister, Kamsi, was a Catholic nun. She's 12 years older than Wanda. And here she is with us in Florida a few weeks ago. She lives in Paris now, and she was here to visit us a few weeks ago. About half of Wanda's family is Catholic, the other half is Buddhist. Kamsi was in Thailand doing work for the Catholic Church at a refugee camp when the communists consolidated their grip over Laos. So Kamsi was not able to get back into Laos. However, Kamsi was able to connect with some human smugglers who knew how to get people out of Laos to Thailand. That was their business, smuggling people out of Laos for money. You might say they were gangsters. You might also say they were just trying to survive like everyone else. These smugglers were kids in their late teens and early 20s. And Kamsi had some gold. Remember, mom had built a nice cash for gold business. So Kamsi agreed to pay an amount for each member of the family who the smugglers could get out and bring to the refugee camp. The smugglers always wanted more money. Once Kamsi agreed on a price, they always came back with a new price. The price was always changing, always going up, because they saw that Kamsi had some gold. She would pay half in advance and half when the family member was delivered to the refugee camp. And Wanda's job in this project at the age of 13 was to help with the transportation of the family on the Laotian side of the Mekong River. The family had a big motorcycle. Wanda was a very good motorcycle rider. The motorcycle was too big for Wanda. It belonged to her older brother, Sakta, who was in his early 20s at the time. But Wanda rode it a lot. She loved the motorcycle. So here's how the escape plan worked. Two of the smugglers showed up at Wanda's house in Laos. They brought with them a letter and a photo of Kamsi as proof of who they were. They then outlined the plan and instructions for Wanda's mom. The smugglers could take two family members at a time who would need to show up at a specified location about 40 miles away, out in the middle of nowhere, at the edge of the jungle on a certain day at a specified time. The smugglers would meet them there 
and take them across the Mekong River to Thailand. That's all they said to Mom. The smugglers then disappeared. At the designated time and day, Wanda would transport two of her siblings on the motorcycle to the drop-off point near the edge of the jungle. This was an 80-mile round trip. On the trip involving Wanda's oldest brother, Sakta, he would drive the motorcycle, and Wanda would ride along with the youngest brother, Kam Suk, between them. Kam Suk was eight years old. Wanda would wrap her arms around Kam Suk and Sakta so that Kam Suk would not fall off the motorcycle. At the drop-off point, Sakta would take Kam Suk to meet the smugglers. They would disappear into the jungle. Wanda would then ride 40 miles back home by herself. Her job was to come back with the motorcycle, then conduct the next trip, whenever that would occur. On this trip, Wanda was riding the motorcycle back to her house from the drop-off point, but she got stuck at a traffic light on an uphill section leading into the Pakse Bridge. Her motorcycle tipped over while at a standstill because it was very heavy. It was a big bike. Wanda could not get it back up. A communist soldier spotted her and walked over. I was so worried, Wanda says. But she had her papers. You're always required to carry papers. And you were not permitted to leave your town without permission. If she was caught trying to smuggle people out of Laos, she would be taken to a labor camp or maybe even shot along with her entire family. But the soldier did not ask for her papers. He just helped her get the motorcycle back upright for Wanda so she could get back on. And that was it. Off she went, back to the house. Weeks would pass between trips. The two smugglers would show up at Wanda's house without warning and would say they are ready for two more family members. Wanda's father did not want to leave Laos. Wanda only has one photo of him. Wanda does not know why her dad did not want to leave Laos with the family. Wanda would only see her dad one more time in her life. Hey honey, when did, what, how old was your dad when he died? 62. Her dad died at age 62 from cancer. He was a heavy smoker. Wanda's mom was the driving force in the family. The one getting things done, making things happen. She ran everything, told everyone what to do, when and how. She was tough on the kids. She ran the family almost like the military. And mom was very focused on getting the family out of Laos. She remembered what happened when Japan invaded China when she was a girl. The Japanese were killing everyone. The communists looked almost the same to her. Not quite as bad as the Japanese, mom said, but very bad. Finally, it was Wanda and her mom's turn to make the trip to Thailand. They were the last two family members left. The father had disappeared. Wanda doesn't know where. Perhaps to blend in with the extended family and avoid the communists that way. Wanda's mom sewed gold into the fibers of Wanda's clothing. She did this for all the children. This way they would have some money if they needed it. Gold equals money, and you always need money. One day the smugglers showed up at the house for Wanda and her mom. This time it was not two guys as it had been in the past. It was five. And Wanda says this was very scary for her and her mom. But she and her mom decided to go with them. What choice did they have if they wanted to get out of Laos? Plus, Wanda's oldest sister, Kamsi, had already paid them so much money. So Wanda and her mom went with the smugglers. They rode in a wagon 40 miles to the edge of the jungle. They left the motorcycle behind. Then they launched off through the jungle with the smugglers. And there were maybe 12 or 15 other refugees there, hiding in the jungle, waiting for the smugglers to arrive so they could begin their journey. Other smugglers, really gangsters, were also there with the refugees, watching their cargo. Wanda doesn't remember how many there were. She just says it was a big crowd of refugees and gangsters who had guns. Wanda, her mom, the smugglers, and the other refugees walked for four days and three nights through the Laotian jungle. Wanda said they had almost no water or food. She says she thought she was going to die out there. Plus, if they ever got caught by the communists, they would all be shot. No question about that. Wanda says, I was so hungry and thirsty, I had ticks all over my body, including one in my eye. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. After four days of walking, they finally reached the canoes, which were hidden along the banks of the Mekong River. They all went across the Mekong River in the canoes, in the cover of darkness. And when they got to the other side, to Thailand, the smugglers separated Wanda and her mom from the rest of the group. They did not explain why. They just said, come with us. 
The smugglers took Wanda and her mom to a shack many miles into the jungle. They locked them inside and said they would be back. So Wanda and mom slept there for the night. They were alone, locked in a shack in the Thai jungle. Who knows where? Then just before sunrise, five smugglers showed up. They told Wanda, come with us. We're going to the camp now. They told Wanda that her mom had to stay there. She will come later, one said. It was just Wanda, age 13, with five smugglers walking through the jungle. I did not know what would happen, says Wanda. Was I going to be raped and killed? I didn't know. All the other refugees were gone. I walked with these gangsters through the jungle many miles all day. Just me and these gangsters. But the gangsters never touched Wanda. She says these smugglers were actually not such bad people. They were just trying to survive, like all of us. They were running a business, a human trafficking business. But there was no raping or anything like that involved. They just wanted money. And they finally arrived at the refugee camp. Wanda's brothers and sisters were all there. When the smugglers met Comsi with Wanda, the smugglers demanded more money from Comsi, as always. Much more money than the price they'd agreed to. The smugglers told Comsi that they had mom locked in a hut out in the jungle, a long way from here. You pay us more money, they said, so you can see your mom again. Mom was their hostage. The smugglers were demanding ransom. A lot of money. More money than Comsi had. But then mom walked into the camp soon after Wanda had gotten there. Mom had escaped from the shack and had followed them to the camp. Wanda says she started laughing at the smugglers, not so much to make fun of them. She was just thrilled to see her mom walk into the camp, close behind Wanda and the smugglers. It sounds like Wanda's mom was watching them the whole time, following close behind. Wanda's older brother, Sakta, heated up some tweezers and removed the ticks from Wanda's body, including the very painful tick in Wanda's eye. The ticks had gotten very big and very bloated with blood. Wanda says they were extremely painful especially the one in her eye. I thought my head was going to explode, she says. Wanda and her family lived in that refugee camp for about 18 months. Wanda and her family were then granted refugee status. They could choose either to live in France or the United States. All chose the United States, except the Catholic Church told Comsi she needed to be in France. Remember, Comsi was a nun, so she had to go where the church wanted her. So Comsi ended up living in France. Wanda was very sad about that. Comsi had been like a second mom to Wanda, because remember Comsi is 12 years older. Wanda and her family arrived in San Francisco in November of 1979. She was 14 years old by this point. She was wearing sandals and a Laotian dress. Her possessions amounted to one pair of sandals and two dresses. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. Wanda says arriving in America was like landing on another planet. It just looked so different than anything I had seen before, she says. The family was placed in Kensington, Maryland, where a large Laotian community had taken root. About 10,000 Laotians live in Maryland in suburban Washington, D.C. Wanda and her siblings were placed in a local public school. Wanda was put in ninth grade. Wanda did not know any English, and she could not find a Lao to English dictionary. But she found a Thai to English dictionary, so she used that to get by in her classes. When she first arrived at the school, she did not know enough English to be able to distinguish between the boys' and the girls' restroom. She just followed her younger brother Kamla into the boys' room. The other kids all laughed at her when she walked out. Wanda had never heard of any such thing as a men's room or women's room in Laos. This was new for her. By using her Thai to English dictionary, she was able to get through ninth grade with a C grade average. But her English got much better, so she was able to get through high school, she says, with a B average. Very sadly, mom suffered a debilitating stroke during her second year in America. She remained alive, but she was in a coma for 23 years until she died in 2004. Many times, doctors recommended to Wanda's siblings that they pull the plug on mom, but the kids refused, so they took care of their mom in a coma for 23 years. This was very hard on the family. They all had to take turns feeding and looking after mom. So Wanda and her siblings basically raised themselves in America, because remember, their father stayed in Laos. Wanda's oldest brother, Sakta, adopted the name of Peter and became the father figure. I think of Sakta like my true father, says Wanda. 
He made sure we all got to school and made us do our homework. While in high school, Wanda worked several jobs, mostly at restaurants. Upon graduating from high school, Wanda took some classes at Montgomery County Community College. She learned how to use Adobe PageMaker, Quark Express, Excel, and Lotus. She also became a very good typist. She could type at a lightning fast 120 words per minute. She landed a job at Geico in data entry and as a typist. She passed their typing test with flying colors. And because of her newly learned desktop publishing skills, she also laid out a number of Geico's publications. And she took some more classes at Montgomery County Community College, including courses on how to become a legal secretary. I would take any class Geico would pay for, she says. She would constantly check job openings within the company to see if she might be able to move up. And she landed a job as a legal secretary in Geico's legal department. And she was awarded Employee of the Month five times at Geico's corporate headquarters in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and where there are thousands of Geico employees. And I'll repeat that. Wanda was awarded Employee of the Month five times for the Geico Corporation. Let that sink in. And she kept winning Employee of the Month because she would never miss a day of work. And because she could do so many things. One night it snowed many feet. And no one showed up to work at the Geico headquarters except for Wanda. So she would answer the phones and perform any and all customer service duties that day. If she had a question, she would call her boss at home. What are you doing there, he would ask. There's four feet of snow on the ground. Didn't you get the message to stay home? Her supervisors loved Wanda. She was a legal secretary who could type 120 words per minute. She could lay out Geico's publications with her desktop publishing skills. And she was never late for work, not even by a minute. She never missed work, not one day, ever. Wanda says, I never understood how people can say they were late because of traffic. Don't they know there's always traffic? Wanda also oversaw all the private detectives who would conduct investigations for Geico's legal cases. And she would keep track of when Geico's lawyers had to be in court to file their motions and argue their cases. She even learned how to write and file motions herself with the court on behalf of Geico. She would use previous court motions as her template and then just fill in the new info. The lawyer then would look it over and make some adjustments to the motion, but Wanda had already done 90% of the work for the lawyer. She essentially ran the legal department at Geico. Do you know you're supposed to be in court in 30 minutes, she would tell a lawyer. You need to get going now. Her brother-in-law, Kikio, did manage to escape the communist labor camp in Laos after five years there. And that's an incredible story on its own. He had somehow made his way to Australia, where he opened a restaurant and became quite prosperous. And I'm only giving you the bare outline here of what Wanda and her family went through. At some point, I'd like to write the family story. There are so many angles and subplots to their story, like War and Peace, and their story could definitely be a movie. Wanda sold his brother Sakta, his American name Peter, also became quite prosperous. He became skilled in technology and engineering. He worked 60-hour and 80-hour work weeks for Siemens Corporation, installing security systems and collecting lots of overtime pay. He also bought many rental properties and became a multimillionaire, at least in terms of net worth. He sunk every dollar he had into his rental properties. Wanda also bought rental properties with money she was earning from Geico, plus her weekend job working as an assistant to a major realtor in the Washington, D.C. area. Wanda would show properties for this realtor, and she learned the ropes that way. Wanda spends most of her day now managing her rental properties and 27 tenants. She really likes doing that. When I reflect on all that Wanda has been through and all she's overcome to achieve what she's achieved, it more than annoys me when I hear Americans tell me how stressed out they are about life. She escaped the communists when she was 13 years old. She arrived here with nothing, not knowing any English. Her dad had stayed in Laos. Her mom had had a stroke their second year here and was in a coma for 23 years. But she was able to make a tremendous success of herself because she has true grit. The same can be said for the rest of her family. These are very tough people. So when we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. Wanda can't believe how soft so many Americans seem to be. It's a mystery to her how America somehow became the richest, most powerful nation on the planet. I think we're still living off our laurels from World War II. I think we're a nation in decline. But I love thinking about Wanda as a 13-year-old girl ripping across the Laotian countryside on that motorcycle, dodging the communist soldiers. That's just unfathomable to me. 
Wanda defines rugged. She has no fear. Wanda also has two sons from a previous marriage. One is David, who served one tour in Iraq and two tours in Afghanistan. He has amazing stories. Her second son is John. He's also a great guy and a very hard worker. He works as a plumber. We're very proud of them both. Okay, now let's switch to my legal battles with my ex Betsy. And many of you are asking these questions in the comments to my previous videos. Many of you are asking, why would I give my ex 97% of the family assets at the end of the marriage in 2004, totaling about $1.8 million, and then leave myself with just $72,000, which was quickly consumed by lawyers? And why would I agree to pay my ex $18,000 per month in alimony and support, which was later reduced to $12,000 per month after extensive litigation? And why would I agree to pay child support until each kid turns 22 years old? And these are all very good questions. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more background on my divorce from my ex, more detail than I've previously provided. My wife and I got separated in 2004. We got divorced in 2005. We'd been married since 1987. We have four children, the oldest being my son, and then three daughters. We lived in Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., in Fairfax County. I'm not going to go into all the issues that led to our divorce, but one of the big points of friction was different attitudes we had about money. She was a spendaholic, frankly. Now, I grew up in Vermont and was basically a country boy with pretty simple tastes. A big house and big lifestyle were never important to me. I often say you can only live in one room at a time. Why do we need all these rooms? What's even the point of living in a house that's bigger than you need? Warren Buffett has the same belief. He's worth $140 billion. He's the greatest investor of all time. He still lives in his middle-class house in Omaha, Nebraska that he bought in 1958 for $31,000. I have a similar attitude toward money as Warren Buffett. Why spend more money than you need to spend to have a perfectly comfortable life? I built a successful advertising agency. I was making quite a bit of money. When we had Peter, our youngest son, in 1994, we decided that Betsy would be a stay-at-home mom. Betsy actually had an extensive work history. She was working in the Reagan White House when I met her, and I had written speeches for Reagan's 1984 presidential campaign, also for George H.W. Bush's 1988 presidential campaign, and I wrote speeches for many prominent politicians of that era. In fact, my first business was a speechwriting business. This then morphed into an advertising agency because I found that I could make more money writing advertisements than speeches. The problem with writing speeches is that once the speech is written, the money stops flowing. The only way you can make more money as a speechwriter is to write another speech. So you're basically selling your time for money. With advertising, you charge a creative fee, a fee for writing and creating the ad, plus you earn a royalty or you earn a percentage of the advertising buy. So you create the ad once, and so long as that ad is being used, so long as that ad is running, you receive a steady stream of income. And I can talk about how I set up my businesses in other videos. So my advertising business is quite successful, but I'm not really motivated by money. I just do what I like to do, which is write and create. The money then just seems to flow in automatically, almost without me thinking about it. And this actually goes to my whole approach on how to succeed in life. And that's to focus on your daily process, your daily routine. Not so much on the goal. I believe in process over goals. If you have a good process and a good routine, good things tend to happen. So I've written seven books. The way I set out to write a book is not to think about how difficult it will be to write 300 pages or 400 pages of manuscript. Instead, I set out to write three pages a day. And then after 100 days of doing that, I have a 300-page manuscript. I have a book. The way you run a marathon is one step at a time. Don't think about the 26.2 miles that you have to run to complete the marathon. Just put one foot in front of the other. Just start and then put one foot in front of the other. And keep doing that until the finish line comes in view. If you want to lose 20 pounds, don't think about that goal. Instead, commit to walking three miles a day. And just do that every day, come hell or high water. This becomes part of your daily routine, like brushing your teeth. It becomes part of your life, something that you just do every day. Wanda has a relative in Laos who did this. She walked three miles every day. She lived to be 102. That's pretty much how I approach every area of life. 
And that's pretty much how I built my ad agency. So when Peter was born in 1994, Betsy wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And I was happy with that, even though it meant losing one income. And she still did do some professional work. She wrote a weekly column for Scripps Howard News Service, which I think brought in about $1,000 a month. Now, I was perfectly happy in our townhouse. But because my ad agency was doing so well, Betsy wanted to build a big house in a wealthy suburb of Washington, D.C., a suburb called Great Falls, Virginia. We bought two acres of land, very close to the Tyson's Corner shopping mall, and we built a pretty enormous house. Six bedrooms, 6,000 square feet, not counting the basement, which was also huge. Zillow currently values that house at $2.5 million, and Betsy was spearheading the house building project. I wasn't paying that much attention to what she was doing on it. But once I saw the scale and scope of it, I was pretty annoyed and pretty stressed out by it. And I'm told our builder had a nervous breakdown through his dealings with Betsy. After he would complete some element of the house, she would change her mind, saying something like, well, I like it, I like it, but do you think you can move that wall maybe three feet to the left? And she said to me, you know, I know you approved this plan and that you don't want a gigantic mansion, but do you think we could at least make the foundation three feet bigger all the way around? Three feet bigger doesn't sound like much. So I said, okay, really without thinking about it much. And by three feet out, she meant three feet out on every side of the house. And that turned a damn big house into an enormous mansion. And I really didn't want to be a slave to an enormous mansion. It's not just the monthly payments on the mortgage. It's the watering system for two acres of land. The grounds crew required to keep up the property, the property taxes, the insurance costs, the cost of maintenance, and so on. And the photo here really doesn't capture how enormous this house is because much of the structure is in the back. And here's what our old street looks like. Our house was on two acres of land, just down the street from the famous malls of Tyson's Corner, where you will find the Ritz-Carlton and all the high-end stores. So this was primo real estate just outside of Washington, D.C., on Darrell Lane in Great Falls, Virginia. You can look up this street if you want. I wondered what my clients might think. They might conclude they are overpaying me. If you hire a lawyer, you really don't want the lawyer whose offices look like the Taj Mahal. You want a lawyer who looks like he's more interested in saving money, not spending money needlessly. You want a lawyer more like Better Call Saul. Well, maybe not Saul, but you get my point. And I think the same rule applies to an ad agency. Most clients, most businesses think they're being ripped off by their ad agency anyway. The last thing you want to do is reinforce that impression. But it wasn't just the house. We also had nice cars, a Jaguar, a big Lexus, an Audi A6. And of course, we had to join a fancy country club. The initial entry fee for this country club was $50,000 plus $800 per month. And that's before you spend any money at the club for dinners, at the nice restaurant and whatnot. Back then, this club was called Lowe's Island. It had two championship golf courses, approved for US Open play, tennis courts, a swimming pool, and a really nice clubhouse with a fancy restaurant for fine dining. And this club was bought by Donald Trump and is now called the Trump National Golf Club. And I'm sure the initiation fee for this club today is 200,000 or something like that. I tried to look up the initiation fee, couldn't find it. The website just says, contact the club. Betsy was very much into appearances and impressing our social circle. I was not into that at all. And I didn't like being a slave to the monthly cost of this lifestyle. I was perfectly happy in our townhouse. Yeah, I knew we'd have to upgrade to a single-family home as more kids are born, but I was not anticipating anything like the house we ended up with in Great Falls, Virginia. One of the breaking points for me was when Betsy said, you know, we really cannot live on anything less than $30,000 per month. And of course, that would be after taxes. And I'm like, are you kidding? And remember, this was in the 1990s, so tack on 50% for inflation. So that would be like $45,000 a month today just to cover our fixed monthly costs. So when we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. And it is true that my ad agency was throwing off quite a bit of money, but I didn't know if that could be sustained. I would much rather bank that money than spend it on a big lifestyle with lots of overhead. And almost all my income came from a few big clients. I was not sure if this income was stable. Plus, I think I kind of had imposter syndrome. I really wasn't sure if I had just been lucky to build this business. What if my big clients went away? Would I be able to replace that income? What if the economy tanked? In the advertising business, the first expense that businesses cut is advertising and marketing costs. 
The advertising business is very cyclical. Also, income tended to arrive sporadically, often big chunks, then nothing for a while. Plus, I had staff and offices I had to pay for. This just wasn't a lifestyle I wanted to be a slave to. I did not like the financial pressure. I didn't want to be a hamster on a wheel. I would be perfectly happy in a rural setting with a house on a hill overlooking a pond or a river. The kind of house that I grew up in in Vermont. That's my style. And that kind of life can be cheap. The last thing I wanted to do was support a giant infrastructure. Supporting a big infrastructure with big monthly costs is not my idea of living. That's slavery. To me, the best status symbol there is, is a house with no mortgage. I'd much rather have a middle class house with no mortgage than an enormous house with a big mortgage. This difference in attitude toward money and vision of what life should look like created a lot of friction in my marriage to Betsy, who now wasn't really bringing any money to speak of because she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Well, she did have her weekly column for Scripps Howard News Service, but that only brought in about $1,000 a month, so basically nothing. And I was kind of wondering, where is all this money going? Why are our credit card balances so high? Also, why do you need a boob job? Why do you need a nose job? I like your nose the way it is. Why do you need liposuction? You're not fat at all. And why do you need a facelift? Your face looks fine. So we just had very different ideas about what life should look like. Despite all these tensions, we had more kids, which kept the marriage together even though the marriage was not great for a whole host of reasons. We were in fights all the time about money. And maybe one reason we had four kids was to keep the marriage going. I think we both knew the marriage was hanging by a thread. But we both believed in the institution of marriage until death do us part. We didn't believe in divorce. And I have a bit of a different view now. Till death do us part worked fine when life expectancy was 28 years old. But realistically, how well does that work when life expectancy is 85? Hey, if you're lucky and marry the right person, great. But that's a bit of a moonshot. Half of marriages end in divorce. Among those marriages that last, about half those marriages are in big trouble and mainly survive because of inertia. I'm not sure what the answer is, but that seems to be the state of affairs in America today. And the number one friction point in marriage is disagreements about money. I think marriage counselors all agree on that point. If you and your spouse are not in agreement about money, and what life should look like, it's going to be very tough to keep your marriage together. And what's great about Wanda is she's a penny pincher, almost to an extreme. She's a coupon collector and saver. If she thinks she's being overbilled by Comcast or some service, she'll stay on the phone for hours to save $10. She wears them down. And she does this as a matter of principle. Even though it's really not worth all that time to save $10, I would just let it go. But not Wanda. That's just how Wanda is. Without getting into any more detail as to the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the marriage with Betsy, I'll just say at this point, we agreed to separate in 2004 and divorce in 2005. And I decided to just pretty much let Betsy have all our assets, or 97% of our assets. And that totaled about $1.8 million for Betsy. I kept $72,000. So $1.8 million for Betsy, $72,000 for me. Many ask, why would I agree to that arrangement? Usually marital assets are split 50-50. Well, my answer to that was I wanted to make sure that the kids could continue living at their current level and wouldn't need to downgrade their lifestyle because of the divorce. In addition, I initially agreed to pay Betsy about $18,000 per month in support. That was during the separation. This was later reduced to $12,000 per month after extensive litigation. And also, child support would last until age 22 for each child. In some ways, I thought this might be a money saver for me. Because Betsy was such a spendaholic. Yes, the kids would be able to live at their current level for the most part, but Betsy would have limits on what she could spend on boob jobs, facelifts, clothes, lavish vacations, expensive landscaping, trips to the spa, fancy cars, and whatnot. She would probably have to host fewer fancy parties. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. Betsy also proposed something else that I agreed to, foolishly as it turns out. She asked if it would be okay if she moved the kids to Illinois. Illinois is where Betsy is from, and it's where her family is. I can work from anywhere, 
I'm a writer and a creative type. So I thought, sure, I'll just follow Betsy and the kids to Illinois and I'll set up shop there. What I did not anticipate is that Betsy would subpoena all my clients. She thought I was probably hiding income and more money somewhere. My clients were not interested in being part of any lawsuits or any divorce proceeding. So they pretty much hightailed it for the tall grass and this pretty much destroyed my business. Meanwhile, Betsy sold the house and moved the kids to Illinois almost instantly. I did not think that would happen that quickly. I thought that was more of an option or something that would take a while, but she moved almost instantly. And because Betsy had torpedoed my business with all of her subpoenas and deposition requests to my clients, I was not in a financial position to be able to move from Virginia to Illinois quickly. I figured it would take me about six months to be able to move to Illinois. Until then, I would travel from Virginia to Illinois every four or six weeks or so to see the kids until I could move there full time. Now, remember that approximately $1.8 million that Betsy was supposed to get at the end of the marriage and at the start of the divorce? Well, I was $100,000 short in terms of the final lump sum payment due that I owed in accordance with the divorce decree. So Betsy sued me for the $100,000 that I was short. I had been keeping up with the $12,000 in monthly support, but I wasn't able to come up with the $100,000 lump sum payment that I owed. And for those of you who have not seen the earlier video, I need to repeat a lot of what happened with this jail part. For those of you who have not heard this, some of you who are watching this have seen the other videos. So you can speed through this part if you've already heard it. But I will be adding some more detail here because people in the comments seem very interested in the jail story. So even if you think you've heard this before, you might want to keep listening. I'm adding quite a bit more detail on different aspects of this account, mainly because people in the comments are asking for more detail. But I also think the lessons learned from this can help a lot of people by showing dads what definitely not to do. Okay, so it's $100,000 short of the $1.8 million that I owed Betsy at the conclusion of the marriage and in accordance with the divorce decree. But I was keeping up pretty well with the $12,000 per month in support, though sometimes a bit late with payments. And because Betsy kept subpoenaing my clients and requesting to depose my clients, I had to invent an entirely new business, an online business. Instead of an advertising agency, I launched an online education program on how to write effective advertisements and how to use direct marketing methods to build your business. This would ultimately be a pretty big success, but this new business was still in its startup phase when I entered Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom on July 26, 2006. My new internet business was starting to get some traction, was turning a small profit, students were signing up and paying $38 per month for the program, but it still needed about six months to build up to a point where it was throwing off significant income. So I entered Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom with no lawyer. In fact, my lawyers quit the case the day before the hearing because I owed them a lot of money. I was pouring every dollar I could find into my new internet business. So this was kind of a triage situation going on. Triage is where you have to choose which wounded soldiers on the battlefield to try to save based on their likelihood of survival. That was my situation. I had to choose what to pay and what not to pay. I had to pay Betsy monthly support, but could not pay her the final $100,000 lump sum owed. And I could not pay my lawyers. I figured they could wait. I needed to pour every dollar I could find into my internet business, knowing that each dollar invested would be returned in 45 days and would double in about 90 days. And this was early in the internet era, it being 2006. And internet marketing was not something I had really focused on until this point. When I decided to launch this, I didn't even know how to build a website. I was an offline marketer, mainly using physical direct mail, postal mail. So I had to quickly learn how to build a website, how to create an email marketing system and database, how to use Google Ads to drive traffic to my sales letter page, and how to build a membership website that could bill people monthly. Also how to set up a shopping cart, a payment processor, and be able to accept all major credit cards. I also had to get approved by all the credit card companies to be able to accept credit card payments, which was not easy because my credit rating was horrible by this point. I had fallen to in the 500s. So I had to put up bonds with the credit card companies. It was quite a process to get this all set up, starting from a standstill. Wanda was also involved in helping. She was my tech support. She actually knew a lot more about tech than I did. Plus, she didn't mind spending hours on the phone with customer support 
to have them walk her through how to do all of this. So I entered Judge Alden's courtroom. With one look at Judge Leslie Alden's haircut, I knew I was dead. Finito. Gonzo. He's the wa. I especially knew I was finito when she started asking me questions. I was spending about $5,000 a month on Google Ads to generate students and maxing out my credit cards. And remember, the metric was that it was taking about 45 days to turn a profit on the Google AdWords spend. People would sign up for a cost of $1 for the first month's trial membership. This would then become $38 per month if they stuck with the program. And students could cancel at any time. Later, this business became a pretty huge success, generating about $100,000 per month in gross sales, or about $50,000 per month in profit. But it was only generating about $10,000 per month by that point, with about $5,000 per month going to Google Ads. To say that Judge Alden was unimpressed with my startup internet business is an understatement, to an extreme. And Betsy was in the courtroom with her lawyers. Wanda was also in the courtroom, seated toward the back where she would not be noticed much. Instead of maxing out my credit cards and spending every cent I could find on Google Ads, Judge Alden thought I should be sending that money to Betsy. The problem with that is, I would have no business and no income if I did that. I would therefore not be able to pay Betsy the $100,000 lump sum that I owed her, or the $12,000 per month in support. With no business and no steady source of income, Betsy would get zero. And I explained all this to Judge Alden. I said realistically it would probably take me six months before I could pay Betsy this $100,000, plus keep up the $12,000 per month in payments, all while also building my internet business. It requires money to build a business. But Judge Alden just kept asking me the same question over and over again. Mr. Hart, what is your plan for paying Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her? And my answer was always some variation of this. Your Honor, I will pay Betsy the $100,000 I owe her as soon as I possibly can. And then I'd explain that Betsy destroyed my ad agency by sending subpoenas to all of my clients. I am now building a new business that's working, an online marketing education business. But it needs about six more months to build up. Again, Judge Alden would ask, Mr. Hart, what's your plan for paying Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her? And I would come back with essentially the same answer. Your Honor, I will pay Betsy the $100,000 as soon as I can. I just need some more time for my internet business to build. Judge Alden had my bank statements and my credit card statements in front of her. She would look at them. And it's true that it looked like quite a bit of money was coming in, especially before Betsy had destroyed my business by subpoenaing all my clients. And even then, it looked like quite a bit of money was flowing in from my internet business. But there was this big Google ad spend. So not much net income yet. Then Judge Alden picked up a copy of a book I had written. It was sitting there on her desk, titled How to Write Blockbuster Sales Letters, which is a great book, by the way. Judge Alden starts reading from the book. She quotes a passage from my book. The people you are writing your sales letters to are not stupid. They are intelligent people. Pretend you are writing your sales letter to Warren Buffett. Anticipate the questions he might have. The people you are writing to are not idiots. She then looks at me and says, I'm not an idiot, Mr. Hart. What is your plan for paying Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her? And I said, Your Honor, I don't know what else to say beyond what I've already said. I will pay her as much as I can each month in addition to the $12,000 per month that I've been paying her and will continue to pay. But I think it's going to take four to six months for me to build up my internet business enough so I can pay her the $100,000. At this point, Judge Alden said, Mr. Hart, you are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. Bailiff, remand Mr. Hart to the custody of the sheriff. At this point, police officers put my hands behind my back and put the handcuffs on. I'm like, what's happening here? I try to tell Judge Alden, Your Honor, I'm supposed to teach an online class tonight to my students who are paying $38 a month. What the heck? I don't think she heard me, or if she did, she didn't care. I look at Betsy and her legal team as I'm being hauled out of the courtroom. I silently mouth the words, what the F to them? And then I look at Wanda, who is sitting more toward the back of the courtroom, and I silently mouth the words to her, what the F? And Wanda's looking pretty distressed. I'm walked out the door by the officer. The door is connected directly to a small elevator, which is really a cage as I remember it, which goes straight down into the basement of the prison. And I'm in this sort of cage-like elevator with one police officer. And my hands are cuffed behind my back. 
I say to the officer, what just happened? He says, this happens a lot in Judge Alden's courtroom. I feel bad for you. The next thing you know, I'm sitting in a large holding cell in Fairfax County, Virginia jail with a big crowd of inmates waiting to be processed in to include MS-13 gang members and members of the notorious R Street gang in Washington, D.C. Some of them look like they were from the movie Menace to Society. And I was still dressed in my business suit when I entered this large holding cell area, which is really like a giant cage with maybe 40 other inmates in there. The jail door clanks behind me. An enormous 300-pound black guy called Big Daddy said to me, Hey, what are you in here for with that nice suit, red tie, and shiny shoes? Some kind of computer fraud or bank fraud or something? And I said, Nah, I came up short on money I owe to my ex-wife. So I launch off into my story about what just happened in Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom. Big Daddy called out to the other inmates. He said, Hey guys, come over here. You got to hear this guy's story. This story is great. And they all gathered around to listen. And Big Daddy was clearly the dominant figure in the group. His voice was loud and booming. Plus he was huge. I would guess he's about six foot seven. I was sitting on the cement bench next to Big Daddy. We were there for many hours because life in jail is not a fast moving process. And they all seemed to like me. They were all laughing, including the guy with the Nazi swastika sticker tattoo on his face. And they all couldn't believe I agreed to give my ex $1.8 million plus the $12,000 per month and that I was still $100,000 short. Well, actually, I was short more than that because Judge Alden had also awarded Betsy attorney's fees plus interest. So the bill I owed her at this point was $148,000. One guy who looked like a character out of Menace to Society goes, what the F did you give her all that money for and leave yourself with nothing? Then Big Daddy says, here's what you need to do. You need to phone your ex and you need to say in your sweetest possible voice, you need to say, dear, sweetie, honey, I can't pay you any money sitting in here and then make a deal. And there was one phone in the holding area, but there was a big line of inmates waiting to use the phone and he needed a phone card to use the phone. I didn't have a phone card yet. Big Daddy had a phone card, which he let me use at his expense. That was just amazing. Big Daddy was awesome. He didn't have to do that. I'm very glad he liked me. I was able to get Betsy on the phone, but this was a little bit like having a negotiation with Osama bin Laden. She just kept saying, well, you wouldn't be in jail if you had just paid what you owe. And she seemed pretty amused by the whole thing. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God. And then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. I also call Wanda to tell her what's happening. She's obviously very upset and cussing out Betsy. And I couldn't stay on the phone long because there was a big line of inmates waiting to use the phone. Plus, I didn't want to run up the bill on Big Daddy's phone card. Then one of the guards called out my name, and I exited the holding cell area with the guards. I never saw Big Daddy again. What a bigger-than-life character. A guard put me in handcuffs and led me to the processing area. I was seated handcuffed to a metal chair next to an officer who was inputting data into a computer. He pulled up my record. He looked at my record and said, what did you say to this judge to get one year in jail? Wait, I'm here for a year? What for? Judge Alden had never said anything about this. All she had said was bailiff remand Mr. Hart to the custody of the sheriff. That was all she said. Nothing about one year in jail. Doesn't that require a trial and a jury or something? Nope. For contempt of court, a judge can put you into jail for up to one year. And then I guess extend it from there if she wants. So the officer read from the screen and says, well, this says you're here for contempt of court. It says you owe $148,000 to your ex-wife, and you're here for a year. How did you get $148,000 behind on your child support, he asks. And I said, well, it's not really support. I paid my ex about $1.7 million in the assets we had, which was pretty much all our assets, but I still owe her $148,000 to bring the total to $1.8 million in cash up front and at the get-go. I also agreed to pay her $12,000 per month in support. So all in all, I'm $148,000 short in terms of immediate cash due. 
Why the hell did you agree to all that? asked the processing officer. Who was this judge in your case? Judge Leslie Alden, I said. Oh, that explains it, said the cop. Yep, that judge really hates men. This happens a lot in her courtroom. After the officer finished inputting my info and giving me an inmate number, I was taken in cuffs to an area and given a green jumpsuit. Now, I said in my previous video that it was an orange jumpsuit, but Wanda reminds me that it was actually green. This was 18 years ago, and I always think of prison suits as orange, but the jumpsuit is green in Fairfax County Jail. The cops then took my business clothing, wallet, watch, phone, and everything I had and, and put it all in a plastic bag for safekeeping to be returned whenever I get out. The next thing you know, I'm buck naked and getting a full body cavity search by police officers in the basement of the Fairfax County, Virginia jail before getting into my prison jumpsuit and chained to 11 other inmates. We were led to our cell block. My cellmate was a Cherokee Indian who said he had been convicted of 47 felonies and right now he's in for attempted murder. We actually got along very well. He gave me lots of great legal advice. He told me I would not really be in there for a year. This is contempt of court. The judge is just trying to scare the shit out of you. Your number one objective right now, he said, is to find a way to get a letter to the judge. You've got to say whatever you have to say to get out of here. And this is no white collar work release type program for nonviolent offenders. It's clear Judge Leslie Alden really wanted to send me a message by putting me here. There are about 1,800 inmates in the Fairfax County Jail. The way our cell block was set up is there was one common area that linked to six cells where we slept. Each cell has two cement beds for two inmates. On the cement bed is a thin pad, barely a pad at all really, and no pillow. And my cellmate was the Cherokee Indian. We would talk for hours in there. Not just about my legal case, but about philosophy of life and all kinds of stuff. We were locked out of our sleeping cells all day. So the 12 inmates in this cell block were in the same small all cement common area all day. So we spent all day there just shooting the bull. There was one toilet and one shower out in the open in plain view of everyone. And you got used to it after a while. I got along fine with everyone, even though most were in there on serious violent felony charges. We spent a lot of time talking about how to get me out of there. In fact, that was the main topic of conversation. Everyone agreed with the Cherokee Indian that I needed to write a letter to the judge and offer a payment plan. We talked about how much I should offer. I thought maybe $2,000 a month. They all thought that was way too much. Problem is, if you can't come up with the money every month, you'll be right back here, said the MS-13 guy who was covered in tattoos, including tattoos on his face. Offer $300 a month, said the white guy with a Nazi swastika tattoo on his neck who looked like Charles Manson. I settled on offering $1,000 a month to Judge Leslie Alden and see what happens. Everyone in the cell block thought this was way too much. The Cherokee Indian thought that Judge Leslie Alden would probably let me out if I offered $500 per month. But I decided on $1,000. I wanted to get out of there. I didn't want to take a chance on offering too little and then maybe have to be there another week or another month or whatever. I also figured Judge Alden isn't stupid. She must know I can't pay Betsy anything sitting in here. And my ex was already getting $12,000 per month, but I could not continue paying that if I'm sitting in here. So it was in everyone's interest to get me out of there pronto so I could start making money again. The problem is I could not get a pen. We were not allowed to have anything that could be used as a weapon. After three days in there, I got a visit from the head of the prison, the warden himself. He came all the way down to the deepest, darkest hole in the prison to find out what I had done to end up there. Out of the 1,800 inmates, he wanted to talk to me, Ben Hart. I guess he had read my file and wanted to hear the story. So how did you get $148,000 behind on your child support, he asked. And why did the judge put you in here? The warden was talking to me through the bars of a small window in the steel door of our cell block. I explained that I did not get $148,000 behind on my child support. I then went through all the details of how I paid her close to $1.7 million plus $12,000 a month in support, all payments made. But I had fallen $100,000 short on the $1.8 million we'd agreed to. Then the judge tacked on another $48,000 for interest and attorney's fees. Just wasn't able to come up with the final $100,000 plus the $48,000. Who was the judge the warden asked? Judge Leslie Alden, I answered. 
That explained it, said the warden. She's a real man-hater. Looks like you really pissed her off. He paused. He looked at his file of papers. He then said, even though you've been sentenced to be here, I'm going to move you to work release. Trouble is, we don't have any jobs for you that will help you pay off this $148,000 debt. The jobs we have pay $7 an hour. People who are in work release are there because they're behind on child support. They pay their child support that way. But this is not going to help you get out of your situation. Well, let me see what I can do about this. I can't have you down here. About a day later, guards arrive. They take me to the work release facility. This was low security. I was able to get a pen and write a letter to Judge Leslie Alden. With my proposal to pay my ex $1,000 per month toward the $148,000 that I owed her. Plus keep up with my other obligations under the divorce decree. And actually, they would not let me write my letter with a full-blown pen. What they gave me was a flexible plastic ink cartridge with a metal writing tip on the end of it. Right, metal writing tip on the end of it. And that looked kind of like this, though. I think it was, it was clear. I think it was actually it was a lot more flexible than this. And it was not easy to write a decent looking letter with this flexible ink cartridge. You had to try to hold the metal tip, the metal tip like this, and then write, write the letter that way. So I eventually got this letter written, but I couldn't get a guard to agree to take my letter to Judge Leslie Alden. So I call Wanda. And she could not come and get my letter because it's not visitor's day. I asked Wanda to talk to the lawyers I had not paid, who had quit my case the day before my hearing with Judge Alden. Lawyers were allowed to visit inmates pretty much any time, since legal representation is a constitutional right. A junior lawyer for the firm came to the jail and took my letter to Judge Leslie Alden's office. I did not hear anything back. I thought, well, I guess I'm here for a year. And I started to accommodate myself to that reality. It's amazing how humans can get used to almost any reality over time. Whatever situation is becomes the new normal, the new baseline for existence. And I met some very interesting people in there, including a high-powered attorney who apparently was in there on some kind of fraud. But I would say that most of the people in work release were in there because they had fallen behind on child support. They would work during the day and return to jail at night. The jobs were things like pick up the trash on the side of the road, wash windows on buildings, hang drywall, manual labor type jobs. And the pay, I think, was $7 an hour. This money would then be sent to the mother of their children until they got caught up with whatever they owe. Now, until then, I didn't know we still had debtors' prisons in America. I thought debtors' prisons in the Western world went out with the 19th century or even the 18th century. Wrong. America's prisons are packed with dads who have fallen behind on their child support. Now, technically, you're not in jail for the debt. So I guess technically they're not debtors' prisons. You're in jail for contempt of court. If you are behind on your court-ordered payments, you are by definition in contempt of court. And even though it's work release on pretty low security, it doesn't mean there aren't rough characters in there. There are some truly scary inmates in work release, one white guy in particular. He offered to solve my problem with my ex for $800. I won't even repeat the details of what he said could be done. So I stayed away from him. That kept me awake at night. Holy crap! So yes, there were some hardcore violent felons in work release. These were felons getting set to be released into society, so had been moved out of heavy security to work release, in preparation for release onto an unsuspecting public to commit more real crimes. One day a week is visitor day, so my status in the jail was increased dramatically when Wanda walked in dressed to the nines. She looked great. The inmates were like, man, wow. And I told them she was my girlfriend. And one said, even more impressive, she knows you're dead broke. Oh, your ex $140,000 plus $12,000 per month. And she's still coming to visit you? That's a good woman. You'd better keep her. The thing I hated most about jail was the food. The food was just awful in there. Bologna sandwiches on white bread for lunch. And that was the best food they usually gave us. They served us some kind of horrible gruel for breakfast and dinner. I lost 10 pounds in there. Just could not eat this awful food. Made me want to throw up. Well, once a week we did get fake eggs for breakfast. That was supposed to be a treat. And one day a week we got fried chicken for dinner. That was also supposed to be a treat. There was also something wrong with the water. I felt like the water was corroding my teeth. The food was supplied by a private company. 
It just could not be worse. And after meals, if you can even call these meals, we were searched by guards when coming out of the cafeteria in order to make sure that we were not carrying any utensils out with us that could be used as weapons. Despite these searches, some inmates were finding ways to smuggle fruit out of the cafeteria. Chunks of melon, mostly. Melon chunks were just about the only food that was edible in there. And the inmates would use these melon chunks to make wine. The wine-making operations in people's cells were well hidden. I was offered some, but I declined. I would have loved some wine, but didn't want to take any chances with this stuff. Oh, and there's another fun detail. I was the only one in work release still in a green prison jumpsuit. Everyone else had regular clothes. They had jobs during the day, then returned to jail at night. But they could still dress as civilians. But there was no job for me to do. There was no $7 per hour job that they could give me that would help me with my $148,000 debt. I was not even supposed to be in the work release area. I was sentenced to be in the deepest, darkest hole in the Fairfax County Jail. But the warden basically just overruled Judge Alden and put me in the work release section, even though I wasn't supposed to be there but I still had to wear that green jumpsuit. So I really stuck out like a sore thumb in there. The other inmates would ask me why I was still in this green jumpsuit. So I'd launch into the story. And this provided great entertainment for everyone. I hadn't heard anything from Judge Leslie Alden. Didn't even know if the judge had received my letter. I assumed not. Then one day at around 5 p.m., I was on my bunk bed reading. I heard a guard yell my name repeatedly. Benjamin Hart, is Benjamin Hart in here? Yeah, that's me, I said. Come get your shit and get out of here, he said. So I went to the booth where they had my stuff. It was all in a plastic bag. My business suit was wrinkled and a mess, but everything was there. My wallet, my watch, my phone. I called Wanda. I asked her to pick me up. She said she could be there in 40 minutes. That's about the time it takes to drive from Rockville, Maryland to the Fairfax County Jail. I got out of my green jail jumpsuit and put on my wrinkled business suit. The warden was there to meet me on my way out. He was smiling. You'd better write fast and write every day to keep up with your payments, he said. I don't want to see you back here. Thank you, I said. Thank you for getting me out of the hole and up here. I'm not planning on coming back. The problem was I still had to pay my ex $12,000 per month, plus now $1,000 per month. This was no joke, especially since I had no business anymore. I had been in jail for eight days and eight nights. When I got out, my internet business was on the ropes. Students were quitting and asking for refunds because they didn't see any seminars happening. I left jail with $5 in the bank, no clients and no business. Wanda and I had pretty much maxed out our credit cards. But my internet business was not completely gone. I sent out an email to all my students saying an emergency had come up and that the online seminars were resuming. So enough of them stuck with the program and we rebuilt. I married Wanda four months later on December 6. I thought any woman who would stick with me through this is absolutely marriage material. She sure wasn't into me for my money or my looks. So Wanda quit her job at Geico to help me with the internet business. She was great with customer service and tech support. We built up the online marketing education program to about a thousand students pretty quickly, each paying $38 per month. While we were doing that, I made the trip to Illinois every four to six weeks to see the kids. By April of 2007, I thought I was financially strong enough to move to Illinois with Wanda full-time. Oh, and the $1,000 per month that I was supposed to pay toward the $148,000 debt? Well, that was temporary. To stay out of jail, I had to promise to Judge Alden that I would pay it off in 24 months, or it would be back in the slammer for me. By the way, when I say I paid Betsy $12,000 per month, here's where that number comes from. Because Betsy is challenging this number. Well, it was... $4,000 for alimony, $4,600 per month for child support until age 22, $800 per month for the college fund, $1,000 per month for life insurance, $400 per month toward Betsy's health insurance, $1,000 per month for health insurance for the kids, and there were about $1,000 in monthly costs for out-of-pocket medical expenses for the kids. Why $1,000 per month for out-of-pocket medical costs? When I was a kid, I saw a doctor maybe 10 times total throughout my whole childhood. Hardly ever went to the doctor. Well, under our divorce decree, medical costs include more than just usual items that we think of as medical costs. Also included endless counseling and therapy sessions for the kids, plus eyeglasses, contact lenses, braces, etc. that were not covered by insurance. Betsy also seemed to be racking up extra unnecessary medical costs 
just to stick it to me. Constantly taking the kids to out-of-network doctors that were not covered by insurance. And we actually had a lawsuit over this. So there was that aspect. So really, it was more than $12,000 per month for support that I was paying. So Wanda and I move out there in April of 2007. We are headquartered at the Homestead Inn in Lombard, Illinois, about 15 minutes from the kids, while we look for a place to live in LaGrange near the kids. Betsy is warning me in emails and text messages not to move there. She says I'll regret it if I do. So one Saturday, I think it was the second Saturday we were there, I swing by the house to pick up the kids. We go to breakfast and mini golf. After breakfast, Tori said she didn't want to go to mini golf. She wanted to be dropped off at home. So I drop her off at home. It was then me, Pete, Maddie, and Olivia at mini golf. After we're done with that, I bring them home to Betsy's house. When I arrive, Betsy is standing there. I get out of the car to help Olivia out of the car because she's little. Betsy comes over to talk to me. She shows me her iPod. iPods were a big thing in 2007. She tells me she's been recording all of our conversations, including, I guess, when I was calling her a bunch of names. We were having many nasty conversations after my stint in jail. I didn't know what might be on the iPod. And she was holding this iPod in my face, I guess recording what was happening. And I'm sure I called her a bunch of names. Since she was holding the iPod right in my face, I quickly snatched it out of her hand and headed to the car. Betsy then jumps on my back as I'm trying to get in the car. I shake her off, but she dives into the car after me and is sprawled across my lap trying to get the iPod. I push her out of the car as I'm taking off. I throw the iPod out the window on my way back to the homestead. I was told by my lawyer later that this was a big mistake because surreptitious recording of a conversation is a crime in Illinois. Meanwhile, Betsy goes to the police and files a domestic violence charge against me. She also files a charge of theft of her iPod. Wanda and I went to a restaurant right next to the homestead where we were staying. From the restaurant, we could see the police arriving at the homestead. We watch. We figured they might be looking for me. After the police leave, we go to our room to get our stuff. The front desk tells us that the police are looking for me. We decide to drive to Maryland where Wanda's family lives and regroup. We stay there until December. We live in the basement of Wanda's brother, Peter. We were basically in hiding. I needed time to build up our internet business some more so I could return to Illinois and hire lawyers. I stopped paying Betsy any support while we were building the internet business and building up our finances. And I was considering all options by this point. I was thinking, should I leave the country? I could run my internet business from anywhere in the world. But I did not want to give up on having a relationship with my kids. By December, I felt I had the finances to be able to pay Betsy all back support, plus hire a lawyer. The problem, of course, was that I know if I showed up in Illinois, I would be arrested. There was a warrant out for my arrest. So Wanda and I had to sneak back into Illinois undetected, get set up, hire a lawyer, and turn myself into the police. We rented a truck from Budget, packed up all our stuff with help from Wanda's brother Peter, and launched off from our hideout in Peter's basement in Maryland to move to Illinois. The problem was I was pulled over by a state trooper in Indiana because one of the taillights in the truck was out. This was late at night, around 11 p.m. I pulled out my license and registration. The cop goes back to his car to check me out. He comes back and says, do you know there's a warrant out for your arrest in Illinois? I answered, yes. We're actually heading back there to deal with that now. In fact, we're moving to Illinois. All our stuff is in the back of this truck. The officer asks Wanda to step out of the truck so he can interview her. He apparently thought Wanda might be Betsy and that I might be kidnapping her or something. Wanda explained to the officer that she's my current wife and that my ex-wife Betsy had actually attacked her husband, me, outside her house when he was dropping off the kids, then filed a domestic violence charge against him. So we're moving to Illinois right now to deal with this situation. Thank God the officer decided not to arrest me. He decided to let us continue our trip to Illinois. He probably did not want to deal with the hassle of booking me into a jail in Indiana and then contacting Illinois police to have them come and get me. So that was a scary moment. Thank God that officer let me go. Yikes. Phew. So we continued on our way with our taillight that was out. So Wanda drove the remainder of the trip in case we were stopped again. And we made it into Illinois undetected. I hired a lawyer. 
I turned myself into the police, spent a night in jail. I got out on bond by putting up $300 and began a six-month legal proceeding on multiple fronts. The judge and prosecutors in the case said my snatching of the iPod out of Betsy's hand was technically assault and theft. But I said I'm not sure I even touched her hand. I just snatched the iPod when she put it in my face. My lawyer said the assumption will be that you did touch her hand when you snatched the iPod. So that can be construed as assault plus theft. So in exchange for no trial and no conviction on the matter, I agreed with the court to attend some conflict de-escalation classes and to pay Betsy $120 for the iPod. The conflict de-escalation classes were actually very good, taught by a retired hostage negotiator. Everyone should take this class. There would be fewer deaths from road rage incidents and whatnot. And there were some people in there who had had road rage incidents. Betsy, of course, was suing me left and right. She had filed a protective order against me and filed a motion to prevent visitation. And here's that right here. And Betsy's motion to prevent visitation is actually titled Motion to Strike Petitioner's Petition for Visitation and Motion for Sanctions. Betsy's goal was to prevent me from seeing my kids ever again. She didn't want me seeing them at all. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. I had a better judge this time, a judge by the name of Murphy. Betsy's lawyers told Judge Murphy that I had disappeared and didn't pay support for months, but I was caught up, plus I had paid her interest. And the judge even said, well... He's standing here now. He caught up. He even paid you interest. What do you want me to do? So this was a very different judge, not Judge Leslie Alden. Betsy's lawyers did not like this judge, so filed a motion to move the case from this suburban courthouse to downtown Chicago. The judge this time was not as good as Murphy. He made these legal proceedings a long, drawn-out process, lasting about six months. But he did deny Betsy's motion to prevent visitation and tossed out her protective order. All this set me back another $30,000 in legal fees. Betsy's been telling the kids and everyone else that I was trying to drag Betsy into the car, I guess for the purpose of kidnapping her. What sense does that make? No, I was just trying to get in the car and out of there. Yes, with Betsy's iPod. But Betsy had jumped on my back in an effort to get her iPod back as I was trying to get into the car. And I did push her out of the car onto the street. I then managed to shut the door before she could claw her way back into the car, and then I took off. But I'm sure the kids saw all this commotion on the street outside their house, and then believed Betsy's account of it. The kids, of course, had little or no clue about all these legal battles going on. How I was fighting both financially and in the courts for more than two years to reestablish my right as a dad to have a relationship with my kids. I had no idea that Betsy would take every legal step imaginable to prevent me from moving to Illinois, to prevent me from seeing my kids at all. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. I ultimately overcame all of this, but it's easy to see why the girls think that Dad, me, abandoned them. They had no idea all this was going on. And who knows what Betsy was telling them at home. In December of 2007, Wanda and I moved to a rental property in LaGrange, Illinois, a bit more than one mile down the street from the kids. I saw my son Peter throughout the week. He was always eager to hang out. And I generally saw the girls once a week. And I was always available anytime anyone wanted to hang out. This guy was a completely absent father, completely absent father. Okay, so let's roll tape to see what childhood was actually like for my kids. And let's see how my relationship was with the kids even after the divorce, and even after very ugly legal proceedings. We have with us here Maddie Hart. She is a YouTube specialist. How many, how many videos, Maddie, do you have on YouTube now? About you 54. Say? And what is your goal? One day I want to be a partner. What does that mean? It means you get paid to make videos. Yeah. We're hauling at the sea here. We're heading in a 
over the sandbar. You're looking good. Here comes a big one. Yeah, Photoshop? Yeah. You want Photoshop? Yeah. We're having fun here at the Deep River Water Park in Indiana, just outside Chicago. It's the largest water park in the Chicago land area. Hi, Maddie. Hi. So, so what are your reflections on the day? Um, it was pretty good, except for this really mean lady. <laughs> that was a mean lady, yeah. But uh, we took care of her. It cost me right. $5. Okay, um, any reflections on the day, Victoria? No. Uh, what did you get? What kind of ice cream did you get? Oh, I didn't get ice cream. You got funnel cake instead. You got what? Funnel cake. Funnel cake? Wow, that's pretty good. All right, so how would you summarize the day at the water park? It was pretty good. That lady was funny. How would you rate it? A 9 out of 10? Where, where do you think it fell short? In 2011, Wanda and I bought a house in Willowbrook, Illinois, which was an eight-minute drive from the kids. Had a swimming pool and a water slide, but hostilities from Betsy were still high. Then she got remarried in 2012. She moved one hour north. The kids were older by this point. Betsy married a doctor and a nationally known cancer researcher who founded and runs a cancer research institute affiliated with Northwestern University. He seems like a very good guy. She lives in a $2.2 million house, so she has no reason to complain. At any rate, as the years passed, I thought that all the nastiness had pretty much dissipated. Yes, 2005 through 2008 was rough, but all that just seems so long ago now. Then out of the blue, my 25-year-old daughter Maddie, just this past February and March, posted her attack videos against me. And this really just came out of the blue. This is all a total shock because just this past Christmas, we were all hanging out, having a great time. And just last year, my oldest daughter, Tori, came to one of my breakdance battles. Yes, at age 66, I am the world's oldest actively competing breakdancer. Now, I don't blame Maddie for her videos. I blame her mom for poisoning her mind against me for 19 years. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God. And then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. And ever since my very mild and gentle answer to Maddie's video attacking me, where I just simply corrected Maddie's inaccuracies, my three daughters have stopped talking to me. At a certain point, I just have to set the record straight and lay out the facts, because it's obvious this 19 years of brainwashing has badly affected how my daughters view me. I thought I had overcome all this brainwashing of the girls by Betsy, but apparently not. In the wake of this Maddie video flap, Betsy has started again to call my clients in an effort to torpedo my business. Remember those clients who ran for the tall grass 19 years ago when Betsy's subpoenas flew in? Well, they came back as clients. Why did they come back? Well, because I'm among the best at what I do. 
And obviously Betsy's phone calls to my clients have no impact whatsoever anymore. And it wouldn't even matter if they did have impact. I'm in a position to retire if I want to. I choose not to retire because I like what I do. The good news is, is my relationship with Peter seems unaffected by all this. He pretends he has no idea what's happening. Of course he knows what's happening. He just wants to stay out of it. Smart. We also have Wanda's two sons who are awesome. So if the girls don't change their behavior pretty quickly, they will be written out of the trust that we've set up. And that will leave millions of dollars more for Peter, David, and John, which is fine. Of course, the door is always open for the girls. Well, until I'm gone. And it's too late. And maybe Wanda and I will just spend the girls' share of the trust on world travels and having fun. I'm leaning toward that idea. At any rate, it's onward and upward for me and Wanda. Thank you.